Unity's new high-performance multi-threaded data-oriented technology stack, or Unity Dots for short, is a complete solution that enables you to write highly performant game code with ease. At its core, it's made up of the c -sharp job system, the Entity Component system, and the Burst compiler. And using all three will grant your game performance by default. But it'll also lock your project into a framework that'll require not only a shift in your workflow, but a complete change to how you approach game development in Unity. Now, that's intimidating, and I don't blame you if you decide to hold off on rewriting your entire project in order to use this amazing technology. But it doesn't change the fact that you might need to optimize your code right now. So is it possible to use just a part of Unity Dots? Well, in this video, that's exactly what we're going to explore. We're going to take a game with some CPU intensive logic and try to improve its frame rate using only the C -sharp job system. That's because unlike the entity component system piece of Unity Dots, the job system does not require a wholesale change to your project structure. We should be able to download it, add a few lines of code, and get some major improvements to performance. But before we do that, my name is Charles and this is Infallible Code, a channel designed to help you become a better game developer. If you'd like to learn more about Unity, programming, and game development, then be sure to subscribe. And don't forget to hit that bell icon. In this video, we'll be optimizing a city simulator, similar to City Skylines, which is a game that's pretty well known for being CPU intensive. If you're following along, and I highly suggest that you download the example project and do, know that I'll be using Unity 2019.3.3f1, and there might be some slight differences if you're using another version. When we press play, we can see that, besides a few ships flying around, there doesn't seem to be much happening in the scene. But for some reason, the frame rate is hovering at around 15 frames per second. Let's see if we can use the profiler to find out why. Let's open it up by clicking Window, expanding the Analysis submenu, and clicking on Profiler. Now, the problem we're facing is that each frame is taking a relatively long time to process. That's why our frame rate is so low. As a point of reference, in order to achieve 60 frames per second, each frame will need to take less than about 16 milliseconds to process. If we click on a frame to pause the scene, we can see that each frame is taking about 60 milliseconds to process, which is over double, and explains the 30-ish frames per second that we're getting now. We should be able to find out why using the timeline section at the bottom of the profiler window. This highlighted region represents the frame that we paused on, and this blue bar, which is actually separated into chunks, represents the length of time that our code takes to execute. Clicking through them, it's clear to me that the issue lies with the update method of the building class. But not that the logic itself is inefficient, but that there are so many instances of building in the scene. In fact, there are over 50 of them, and every single frame, each one of them has to wait its turn to execute on the main thread. If only there was a multi-threaded solution in Unity. That way, all of the buildings could run their logic at the same time on their own separate threads. Well, luckily for us, there is, and it's called the c -sharp Job System. Unity's c -sharp Job System is a package that allows developers to write multi-threaded code, which can provide significant gains to your game's frame rate. And when coupled with the Burst compiler, c -sharp Jobs have improved code generation quality that can result in a substantial reduction of battery consumption on mobile devices. Sounds pretty good, right? Let's add the package to our project and see what we can do with it. Back in Unity, click on Window, and then Package Manager. Then, because at the time of this recording, the job system is still in preview, click on Advanced, and make sure that Show Preview Packages is enabled. Now, we can search for the jobs package and click Install. Beautiful. With that out of the way, we can finally switch on over to the code. Here we have the class that's causing all of our problems, the building class. It has a serialized field called floors that we can set in the editor, a private member variable called tenants that's calculated in the awake function, and a property called power usage that gets updated in the update method, and is presumably used elsewhere in the simulation. Now, again, the issue isn't with the code itself, but with the fact that there are so many instances of this class running in the scene. Which is why we're going to try to jobify it so that all of the buildings can update themselves at the same time, or at least as many of them as possible in multiple chunks. The first thing we'll need to do is create a job. Let's do that now above the declaration of building. We'll call it the building update job. All right, so a couple of things to note. One, our job is a struct. That's because the job system doesn't support strongly typed classes. 
This is an important restriction because it gives the job system complete control over how it stores objects in memory, which, as you can imagine, is as optimally as possible. Next, you'll notice that our job implements the iJob Parallel 4 interface. This is one of a handful of interfaces that can be scheduled to run on one or more threads. We're using iJob Parallel 4 because it can run the same logic over a list of items, which is exactly what we'll try to do with our buildings. Now, we'll need a place to schedule our new job, so let's create a mono behavior called Building Manager and give it a list of buildings. Then create a new instance of the building update job in the update method and make a call to schedule. This will get the job running. We'll need to pass in a value for length, which represents the number of items this job will iterate over, and batch count, which represents the size of each threaded batch. Let's use the size of the building list and one. Perfect. Finally, we'll need to ensure that the job finishes its work before the next frame which we can do by calling complete on the job handle object that's returned by the jobs schedule method. All right, so we've created and scheduled our job, but it doesn't really do anything. It needs to calculate the power usage of all the buildings, but we can't pass those buildings in because the job system doesn't support strongly typed classes. To get around this, I think we'll need to encapsulate all of the code that we want to jobify into a struct. So let's nest one inside of the building class. We can call it data. This will give us a little bit of syntactic sugar later on. Now, we just need to migrate all of building's data, which consists of the tenants and power usage field. I think we should leave floors in building though, so we can continue to change it from the editor. Luckily, because data is nested within building, we can still reference floors inside of its constructor to initialize tenants like we were doing in the awake method. Perfect. Lastly, we can migrate this update method and clean up the building class. Awesome. Now we can reference our new struct inside of the building update job. We'll do that by adding an array of data objects for it to iterate over. Again, you'll notice I'm using this native array object instead of the standard c -sharp array. And that's because this is a special type of array that was designed to work optimally with the c -sharp job system. But don't worry, because it works just as you'd expect. First, we'll grab a reference to the current building data object based on the index. Then we'll call its update method. And finally, this is really important, we'll pass the data back into the array at the same index, which is another small quirk of the job system. We can't just use an index reference. We need to explicitly pull the object out of the array, do our work, and then put it back in. Next, we need to update the building manager's creation of its building update job to include a building data array based on its list of buildings from the scene. So let's create an instance of a native array and pass in the size of the building list as its length. We also need to let the job system know how long we need this list to live in memory, which we can do by passing in an allocator. We'll go ahead and use the temp job allocator since at the moment we're only using this list for one frame within a single job. Now we can populate it and pass it into the building update job. Beautiful. The last thing we need to do is dispose of the native array. We told the job system that we only needed it for this temporary job. So let's call dispose right after the job completes. All right, we're just about ready to test this out. But first, let's clean this up by moving the building manager class and building update job struct into their own files. Much better. Now back in Unity, let's wire all this up. First, add the building manager to the parent of all of our building game objects. Then, lock the inspector in place and drag all of the buildings into the buildings list. And that's it. Let's run the scene. Uh-oh. Looks like we're getting an exception. Random range int can only be called from the main thread. Ah, I know what this is. 
another small adjustment we'll need to make for the job system. Let's pop back over to our building data struct. As we can see, it calls the static random class inside of its constructor and update method, which of course isn't supported by the job system. But that's okay because the jobs package comes with a special mathematics library that was designed for this exact scenario. Let's add a new field that uses the random struct in that library. Then initialize it in the constructor with a seed of one for now. And then replace our two calls to the static random class. The method is a little different, but yields the same result. Great. Back in Unity, let's run the scene. Awesome, that solved our problem. So now let's take a look at the profiler and see if our jobification actually worked. Pausing on a single frame, the performance is already looking much better. If we zoom in, we can see that the building manager is in fact scheduling the building update job. And if we scroll down to examine the job section, we can see how the work of that single job is spread across all of the available workers. So for all intents and purposes, we did it. We used the job system to leverage the multi-threading capabilities that are available in Unity without changing the entire structure of our project. But I think we can do just a little bit better. Back in the Building Manager class, we can see that all of this work is being repeated frame after frame in the update method. But we can optimize this further by instantiating both the building update job and building data array inside of the awake method. Let's do that now by introducing fields for these two objects. And then moving their instantiation logic into awake. Of course, now we'll need to modify how we allocate and dispose of the native array. So let's change the allocator to persistent and call its dispose method in on destroy instead of update. All right, looks good. I feel like this is more robust and something that we'll be able to iterate on a little bit better in the future. Let's take her for a spin. Great, works like a charm. That seemed to work out pretty well. Of course, there are other considerations to be made, like how do we relate the new power usage data back to its respective game object? We could potentially use a dictionary or maybe a generated ID, but that's a consideration for another time. In fact, again, I encourage you to download the project, follow along with the video, and see how you can iterate on the code. But I guess the important takeaway is that you don't need to lock your entire project into Unity Dots to get multi-threaded performance. As we've seen with this small example, you can leverage this powerful technology on a case-by-case -case basis. I'd love to hear your thoughts, so feel free to leave a comment below or join our growing community of game developers on Discord, where we can discuss this topic a little bit further. Thanks for watching, and as always, I'll catch you in the next video. A special thanks to my top supporters, Berkwas 3D, Dark Rush Photography, Rstar, Thomas, Trond, Yakub Al-Safari, and Iron Alex.